Hello, everyone. Welcome to our workshop today on the beneficial beauty of rain garden. We are joined today by landscape architect Dave Phelps, and we're really excited to have him here. Um, this is the third installation of our three part drought proof your yard workshop series um, that is presented in partnership with Sustainable Contra Costa and Contra Costa Water District. Um, for those of you joining us right now, if you could go ahead and turn your cameras off um, and mute yourselves, we will have time for a Q&A later on in our presentation, but we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Great. Um, so our agenda for right now um, is I'm Eliana Butrez. I'm from Sustainable Contra Costa. Um, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about SCOCO, including our main projects. Um, then we're going to get in, into some Contra Costa Water District resources. I'll introduce Dave Phelps, and then he will have the floor from there. Um, after his presentation, we'll reconvene for a Q&A session. So if you all have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat during the presentation but we'll go ahead and answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, afterwards, we will be sharing closing thoughts and then just a thank you to everyone participating. Um, so I am here today representing Sustainable Contra Costa. We're a community of educators, innovators, um, and community members who are dedicating to helping create healthy, resilient communities by way of sustainability. Um, we have a series of workshops that we put on, such as this one, um, with some of our partners on these great programs. Uh, we also have regional events, such as the Contra Costa Sustainability Awards. Um, and aside from that, we are heavily involved in the Bay Ren Home Plus program. That's the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. And this is a program that provides rebates and um, assistance in doing home energy efficiency um, upgrades to your homes. Um, aside from that, we have a youth team called Sustainable Leaders in Action. They're awesome. Um, we work on a multitude of programming with them. And we're also involved in the Clean Air Coalition, the East Bay Clean Air Coalition. And this is, um, mostly dedicated to learning about air quality and air quality issues in um, in Eastern Contra Costa County. Okay, um, our main project at Sustainable Contra Costa is the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. Um, this is an online platform with over 80 actions um, that give you different ways to incorporate sustainability into your life. Um, there are, they have differing difficulty levels. So some things are easy, such as taking shorter showers. Some may take uh, more involvement or maybe are a little harder, such as going paperless and trying not to use plastic or single use products. Um, and then we have difficult actions that can range from installing a great water system or replacing an appliance um, for one that's more energy efficient and overall kinder to the earth. Um, the objective for these uh, actions that we have are to um, provide people with uh, ways to save money, energy, water, um, and overall be kind to the, to the earth. Um, so far, we have almost 3,500 households res registered for our platform, which is amazing. Um, we are over 80% of the way to our progress of saving um, 1,200 tons of CO2 by December of this year. So we're really um, pushing along with that. And then here you can see um, otherwise some of our savings, how much, um, how much money we've saved, uh, how many gallons of gas have been saved, gallons of water, which is over 2 million, which is great, and tons of CO2 saved. So right now we are a little over a thousand tons of CO2 saved, um, which is great. Uh, as I said, 
we have different actions um, that are um, that are divided between categories. So we have different categories like eating green and wasting less, being water wise, um, clean energy, things of that nature. Each of those categories have these different actions. So for example, um, here on the right, you can see that our eat green and waste less category has different actions like recycling, skipping the packaging, making a meal plan, um, and we encourage you to join the platform and be able to kind of see um, the, the different actions you're able to take. Um, all of these actions also have custom resources depending on where you live. Um, so it'll show you different options for rebates, um, informational programs, and just overall things that will contribute to your understanding of these actions. Um, in allowing you to implement them into your lives. Um, next, we have the Bayron Home Plus program. Um, I mentioned this a little bit before, um, but this is a collaboration between the nine Bay Area counties um, to offer energy savings programs with funding from the Public Utilities Commission. Um, this program has been going on since 2013, and so far, uh, they have served over 10,000 projects with $21 million in rebates, and this program has no signs of stopping soon, so this is something that will continue to happen um, and is a great overall resource if you're wanting to make home improvements as a homeowner. Um, great. Next, we have our lawn to garden rebate program um, these are resources from contra costa water district and they are co-hosting this program with us they are they are a sponsor of this workshop series um, some of their resources are a lawn to garden website such as how to lose your lawn what the steps you may take to do that um, they have a facebook group um, with other individuals who are maintaining their water wise landscape. So just making sure that you're saving as much water as possible. Um, other than that, they also have gardening in Contra Costa County and seven steps to a new landscape, um, mainly through losing your lawn and replacing it with a garden. Um, now I will stop sharing. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dave Phelps. Um, Awesome, there he is. So Dave Phelps has been at the forefront of organic gardening and regenerative landscaping practices for decades, teaching landscape topics for various agencies, associations, and nonprofits, and managing his landscape architectural firm, Garden Enlightenment. Um, he specializes in Wello, Wello compliance um, and designing beautiful, functional, and ecologically responsible spaces. He has a degree in landscape architecture. He has degrees in landscape architecture and horticulture with licenses in landscape architecture and contracting and has been certified as a landscape technician, a bay friendly commercial sites raider, an arborist, a water efficient landscaper, an irrigation auditor and several more. So without further ado, we're going to turn the floor over to Dave Phelps. All right, thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So yeah, we are talking about the beneficial beauty of rain gardens. And what I'd like to do is point out that we've gone down kind of the, the wrong path, so to speak, the wrong garden path, uh, in that we've got way too much turf and way too many uh, hedged and bald little uh, plants. And so what we want to do is really do kind of a paradigm shift here and respect the fact that our uh, water is super precious and we need to really do this paradigm shift of instead of draining our landscapes, we want to create more of a sponge and infiltrate all of that water. Um, obviously, uh, our planet is huge in terms of water. It's like 70% of our surface. 
uh, we've got a lot of water in us, but the amount of potable available water is very, very small. So we find ourselves now in this kind of weird situation of um, a warming climate. We've got reduced snowpack, and we're really looking at some serious water shortages. Um, un unfortunately, you know, with this drought, uh, it, it's been sort of a, a benefit in some ways in that it has inspired folks to really take a look at our landscapes. And while we've been promoting drought resistant landscaping for many years, it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. So um, now that we're up against the gun, so to speak, and looking at all these restrictions, people are really starting to take that um, step in being more climate appropriate in their landscaping. So I wanted to uh, start this off with uh, a mention for Brad Lancaster. He's got a series of books, and I don't know if uh, any of you have seen him talk before, but um, really neat guy in terms of being able to diagram and describe how to conserve water and get stuff onto your sites. And so um, there's this term, a MEP, maximum extent practicable. And this is so the new thing that we want to do to totally change the paradigm of the drainage system and create an infiltration system. So we want to turn our, our water sheds into water sponges because we really do get quite a bit of water. We get a lot of rain. It just all comes during three months of the year. And then we've got this long, like nine month dry period. So what do we do about that? Um, I wanted to start off by redefining what a watershed is. Now, obviously, everyone thinks about, you know, the greater California watershed uh, bordered by the uh, Sierra Nevadas, uh, or maybe you're thinking about your particular creek or stream or river and, and the ridge lines around that. But on a, a site, on uh, an individual garden, we're really looking at a watershed being the roof, a watershed being the driveway or a parking lot or a landscape area, or maybe even the street out front. If there might be an opportunity to borrow the water that's flowing down the streets. Now, all around the world, there's for, you know, far back into history, people in Mediterranean areas or summer dry areas like we have, they've always had cisterns or some way to capture the rainwater. Whereas we've kind of gone down the path of engineering these extensive drainage systems and storm drain systems, and, and it's gone too far. So right now we're in catch up mode. And the point being that in order to um, not go into these drastic water restrictions and also to handle our atmospheric rivers when we do get them and really be prepared for this rain and make the most of it, we need to look at our landscapes and really change what's there. And I think um, starting out, really our priorities would be to save the trees and of course save water. A big part of saving water is reducing the turf. So what I'm trying to promote uh, here would be to strongly consider taking any turf area that you might have and instead turning it into some kind of infiltration garden, a rain garden, if you will. So we're looking at turf conversions, hydrozoning the irrigation so that we've got plants that use the same water amount of water grouped together on separate valves, upgrading those irrigation systems, reducing, if we can, all the spray systems and transitioning those to drip, lots of mulch, 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 harvest the rainwater, and then whatever flows from that, we're, we're detaching our downspouts from the drainage system uh, perhaps even doing a gray system, but soaking that water into the landscape. So, um, you know, I, we mentioned the WELO, the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. 
And this may not be triggered um, unless there's a design review, a permit, or a plan check, and it has uh, 500 square feet or more of landscape. But the idea is that this is built into our green building code here in California, has been since 2016, and yet a lot of people don't even know about it. And it pretty much says you're not allowed to have overhead spray irrigation within two feet of a hardscape in areas less than 10 feet wide or on slopes exceeding 25%. So that really does you know, make you think, okay, now we can get rid of a lot of that turf and replace it with climate appropriate plants. And so um, sheet mulching is a great way to do that without herbicides. You're composting that existing turf in place. Um, and, and on my website, I've actually got a free sheet mulching course at gardenenlightenment.com that it, it, you might enjoy. That makes it really simple to replace the turf um, with the plants. But what we want to do is we want to get in there and absorb as much of that water as we can. Again, disconnecting the downspouts from the drainage system and getting it into the landscape in what we might call a rain garden. So the neat thing about doing that is that right now there's a lot of rebates and resources. So you can get up to $1,000 for a residential site or up to $20,000 for a commercial multifamily or municipal site through the Contra Costas program. Now, some of the things we might look at here is that you, you don't want to start your project um, before you apply. So get the application and process. And also another caveat is that it's only good for front yards. Uh, so it's not going to work if you're doing a, you know, a, a lawn hidden in the back. But you got to use the approved plant list and you got to put down the mulch and the old spray system has to be totally removed. So I've got some links here um, for the, uh, the actual application. There's the plant list, the project checklist, and then there's a little bit more details in the FAQs. But this is all available on the Contra Costa Water District's website. So you know, the old master gardener chant, we've got compost, 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 mulch, mulch, mulch. And this is, is huge in terms of absorbing water, because if we can get compost into our soils, we're going to increase the aggregation of those soils. And that increases the pore spaces between the aggregates. That makes, we, give, we get a better infiltration rate we have better water holding capacity, and it also gets oxygen deeper into the soil so that we have a deeper root zone. So the plants can get more nutrients and more water. And again, making sure that we've got these, um, the, essentially water repositories in our landscape so that very little, or uh, we're reducing the amount that goes off site to the maximum extent practicable. So this is this paradigm here where we're looking to move um, our landscapes forward in succession, increase the soil organic matter, and thereby increasing that aggregation. There's a cool word called pedogenesis, where we're, we're creating those aggregates or peds, and that increases the amount of water and the root zone. So Ideally, what you'd have is you would take advantage of the giant watershed that we've got on our roofs um, and then store as much of that as you can to use during the dry months. And then whatever overflows will go through your rain garden and hopefully hardly anything will then get into the storm drain. So a, a simple rule of thumb we've got here is that uh, you get about 62 gallons per 100 square feet for every inch of rain. So if, if we look at a typical system here, you've, we've got our roofs and our gutters, our downspouts. We wanna do some um, leaf diverters so that we don't get the debris into our tanks or storage. And then we wanna make sure that the overflow gets out into our rain gardens. And then we can both use the water 
during the dry season and infiltrate to the maximum extent practicable um, any of the excess water of the system. Uh, there's a lot of resources online for rainwater capture, but the, the big ones would be that, you know, obviously it's not potable unless you have special treatment. You really have to be careful about mosquitoes. So you want to make sure you've got a 16th inch screen in there uh, so that we don't have vector control issues. And the tanks really should be opaque. So you don't want to be growing a bunch of algae. And then of course, a backflow preventer so that we're not we don't have that cross connection between the potable system and your rainwater capture. So you can do that in tanks, you can do that in rain barrels, every little bit can help. And, but I guess the, the big aha here is that you, you can get quite a bit of water. Here's some uh, examples of some uh, filters or leaf diverters. What this really is, is is the acknowledgement that we're gonna get a lot more rain than we can actually store. So it makes sense to let the uh, surface clean off first before we start to capture that water. And then of course, once we've got it, um, being able to use it out in the garden once things are dried up is really nice. And there's ways to do this with pumps. You can do solar. Uh, you can even do uh, a human powered irrigation system, which is kind of fun. So what I wanted to do is just kind of do a quick calculation here to show um, how much rain we're actually getting here. So if, if we look here, this is in Contra Costa at the center, um, which isn't uh, really as much as the average of the whole area, um, but we can see here, if we were to add up the, uh, the inches, we're looking at the different inches per month, and we're putting it into this equation. So we're taking the square foot of the area <laughs> times the rainfall times uh, 7.48 gallons per cubic foot and times the runoff coefficient. Now the runoff coefficient just uh, means that you're not gonna get all the rain. And so a good coefficient at this point for the average roof is about 80%. Um, 80, 80 to 90% or 0 0.8 to 0.9 in that equation. So look at your roof. Look at where the downspouts are. See which ones are hooked up to the drainage system and see if we can disconnect those downspouts into the garden and create some kind of a dry creek bed um, or a riparian corridor, I like to put it, um, and maybe put a tank or some kind of collection thing right there in between. So you're collecting a little bit and then the rest goes out into the garden. So what you wanna do is look and measure and you can figure out how many gallons you're gonna get per downspout just by looking at the different roof uh, surfaces and which downspouts they go to. And then we look at the um, coefficient. Again, here a conservative estimate is that you're gonna get about 80% of the rain. So if we look then at this, um, and again, this is from the um, Contra Costa uh, Center. And, and what I like to do is ignore those months where you're gonna get less than a quarter of an inch. So you just add up all of this, and then you wanna divide by 12 because we're looking for feet of water, not inches of water. But if you do this um, experiment here, where I had uh, looked at a roof area for a downspout of 252 square feet, and what? that area gets a little over 16 inches uh, of rain. And so if we do that calculation, Right, we're coming up with about 2,080 gallons just for one downspout. So that's a lot of rain. Uh, there's a lot of other resources here for capturing uh, rainwater and then how to then take it into the garden. So let's really look at this idea once we've captured as much as we can and we're gonna let the overflow go into the garden 
what can we do then uh, once we've detached those downspouts and maybe detached some of the hardscapes and flowed all of that rainwater into our landscape? So again, there's this idea of MEP. We're going to keep water on site as long as possible, as long as practicable. We're looking at avoiding standing water for more than 48 hours because then we've got mosquitoes. We also want to make sure that any um, dry creek beds or retention ponds that, that we establish don't exceed 18 inches in depth because um, that's that's at a point where you know toddlers can can have problems. It's uh, it would be considered a pool at that point, and you'd need a fence. So we also don't want to have water too close to foundations, and we always want to figure out an overflow, right? Um, there's what I like to call the Goldilocks thing: is that you don't want water flowing too fast through this type of system, as it will cause erosion. But you also don't want it to go too slow, right? So you want things to get to soak in um, and also get filtered and slowed down. There's the old saying of spread, sink, and um, and <laughs> slow well, uh, well we'll skip on that one anyway the the main thing here is try and make these things look natural right um this picture here where we've got this straight uh drainage course where we have little rows of rock and plants right through the middle that never happens so we don't want to do that we want it to look as natural as possible and and turn these watersheds into water sponges. So no straight lines, no rows of rocks, right? Um, we want um, to make sure we've got a, a meander, right? And because we want these things to look natural as if it was naturally cut through our landscape. And there's a, a nice way to do this where if, if we look here, we've got it, this is the flow line and it's meandering through this area. And what we're, we've done is we've got these larger, more terrestrial rocks up against, like this would be uh, the bedrock, if you will, that turned the water this way, and then it hits some more rocks this way, maybe goes over a little spillway around this way. So this is a neat way to introduce a very natural looking riparian corridor with the infiltration pockets. And as you dig this out and mound up between there, you're accentuating the geography of the landscape and making it a little more interesting, lots of um, aesthetic uh, value there. And then what we wanna do then is, is look at where these infiltration areas are and corresponding plant community elements. And then we can get into planting this so that it looks more natural. So in nature, water never goes in a straight line. Over time, it meanders more and more. And if we have some kind of obstruction in there, on the other side of that, just downstream, you're gonna have an area. If that area is decompacted, and if we add some compost there, it will infiltrate more of the water into our landscape. And then of course, less will get downstream or wind up in the storm drain. Again, where it turns, if you've got your uh, rocks here, that's gonna be that infiltration area there. And if we've got any kind of a spillway as the water flows, that's another area where we can really get quite a bit of, um, of, of water coming down. And, and just to go back to this one, if we look at where these bigger rocks are, right, that's where the water is moving the fastest and, and eroding. On the other side, we've got an area of deposition. And so this is where we would have what we'd consider like a sandbar. And if you work with the gradation of different gravels and rocks and cobbles and sand, you can get this looking really quite real. And you can also consider adding like some stumps or logs and, and planting some rocks in there. 
So now I want to get into this concept of um, using this dry creek bed with the rocks here set up such that we're mimicking nature. And we've got our areas of um, erosion and deposition. We've got some spillways. But look at here, right where, right before those rocks, this is where we've got uh, the water is going to pool. Um, this would be the biggest of our infiltration areas. And then we are going to use what are considered emergent riparian plants. Emergent plants are those plants that can handle and like to have um, the roots underwater for a period of time, right? On the deposition side where we've got our sandbar, that's more of an early meadow plant community. And then right behind there, it's sort of like the regular uh, succession of plants in nature. You're going to have a more of a later meadow or a, a chaparelli area, right? So we've got more of our, um, a little bit more organic matter, a little bit more uh, fungally dominant soils. And then ultimately up here above where it hasn't eroded out yet, that's where we've got our later chaparral plant community or maybe even a mixed evergreen community. And the neat thing about this is that as you play with these plant communities, you're, you've got more of them. And as they rub together, those edges are called ecotones. And that's where we have the greatest biodiversity. And biodiversity is going to drive resilience in uh, stress and change. And all of our landscapes are under immense stress and change these days. So again, introducing these things, we're gonna have more habitat value, more seasonal interest, and we can really mimic nature here to create these beautiful landscapes. So the other thing to consider here is the depth of these areas. So we're gonna have these different zones where you've got a lower zone where we'll have more of those emergent plants. We're gonna have the mid zone, which is the sides. And then up on the higher zone, we've got a drier plants. So again, the succession of different plant communities, depending on where they are along this dry creek bed or seasonal stream, if you will, and then also on the depths and which ones can handle being inundated for quite some time, and which ones really need to be up on this uh, higher area. There's this nice little um, note here, uh, phytoremediation, which is the uh, ability of plant roots with their associated bacteria and fungi to actually filter out pollutants in this kind of situation. And, and this would be especially important if you're able to say, capture some of the rainwater flowing down the curb, bring it into the landscape, slow it down, sink it in, filter it, and then let whatever uh, overflow out. So let's look at some plants here for a minute. Um, these are some of, these are really my go-to plants here. Uh, two of these are California natives. We've got the uh, Junkus patens, and we've got the Carex tumulocola, also known as uh, Carex divulsa. Both of these plants are considered low water use, so they can handle brutally dry temperatures or dry times. And they can also handle being submerged underwater for long periods of time. This third one in the middle, this is not a California native. It's actually from South Africa, uh, Chondropetalum, the Cape Rush. But I tell you what, um, it, 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 the aesthetics of this one make it a go-to for me. And so the combination of these three along in um, the, these dry creek beds these are what are gonna really give it that riparian feel. And then in that area where we've got next to there, right, if we're going back in here. So, so those guys we just looked at would be in these spots here and here and here where the normally you'd have a, a low point and the water would pool there. And then next to that and up in this little area, we might look at um, the Mimulus guttatus or uh, Yerba Buena, the clinopodium. Uh, the, these plants are, are fantastic for a uh, little color interest and being able to cover 
the soil, which means we're going to have then less weeds. Um, and, and both of these are, are native. The watercress is an edible plant, which is kind of nice to introduce um, a little bit of a food forest paradigm into the landscape. But we've also got um, Monardella, the cowdy mint, uh, Grindelia, and there's a bunch of different Grindelias available. Um, the, the gum weed is, is a wonderful plant, and these are really good for attracting pollinators uh, and for habitat value. And of course, we've got our native uh, Douglas iris as well. Fragaria, you know, when, when we look at, um, oh, and I should point out back here, uh, Clinopodium is one of those rare plants that can handle dry shade. And so if you're looking for a good ground cover underneath an oak, that would be a, a really nice choice, as would be perhaps Fragaria. These guys like a little bit more water, but it's also an edible plant with good habitat value. Uh, Epilobium or uh, Zauschneria or California fuchsia, there's well over a dozen different cultivars of this now, but it has co-evolved at the drip line of oaks and just does a really good job of having that big splash of color late in the season. And of course, the workhorse here is uh, yarrow or achilleas. And there's all kinds of different colors of uh, yarrow now available, but very dependable, um, really good in the rain garden uh, because it can handle that it, it also has a really netting uh, root structure, and so it's going to resist erosion to a, a large degree. Now, getting back up here, um, again, looking into uh, this little area here or up into here where we're a little bit higher up, a little bit deeper soils, um, a little bit more fungally dominant soils. We've got th things like the spice bush, the calicanthus, perhaps an elderberry or ribes, right? So um, there's ribes speciosum, ribes uliginosa, the ribes arium, all these different uh, wonderful plants that have uh, edible components, good for habitat and um, seasonal interest. Some more seasonal interest could be with the Western dogwood, right? Um, Mahonia or even a toyon. Now toyons get quite large, so we're really looking at something up above those terrestrial rocks. Um, this wouldn't be down in the uh, swale itself, but up on, above the edge. Another thing we might look at, Muhlenbergia. This grass, a native grass, is uh, what well, it's just a wonderful thing in terms of habitat. This is the favorite grass for uh, quail to nest in. And it you'll see if you put these guys along the edge uh, in, in a regular fashion. So looking back at that diagram again, right? You might have one here, one here. They're kind of the, on the edges here and more in that chaparral, uh, between the chaparral and the meadow area of in terms of the plant communities it would be these big bunch grasses. And then we've got uh, penstemon. This one is called Margarita Bop, uh, beautiful little penstemon. And of course, our Western red bud. Uh, there's a lot of different red buds, but this one, the, the Occidentalis, is extremely drought tolerant and yet can handle uh, our really wet winters. So remember when I came up with that phytoremediation? Um, there's also phytostabilization, phytodegradation, and rhizofiltration, which are all cool terms, I think. And it really means it's, it's taking the pollution in our waters and either absorbing it, breaking it down, or filtering it out so that the water that goes off into our storm drains is nice and clean, right? Um, and so we've got these hyperaccumulators that can handle things like arsenic, heavy metals, lead, uh, even radioisotopes, I mean, radioactive plants or mercury. So, you know, just looking here, we've got willow, agrostis, armeria, selene, sunflowers, bacopa, uh, more willow. So these are some plants that can really handle some intense uh, pollutions. 
like what we might see come off a parking lot. Um, Agrostis pollens, this is our California native bent grass, and it's available through Delta Bluegrass as a sod, which is pretty cool. Armeria, the sea thrift, this takes a little bit more water, um, but if you put it in the right spot, right, where we've got an infiltration area, this can be a bright thing of color and also do a lot in terms of uh, filtering out uh, some of these uh, heavy metals and toxins. Saline as well as a wonderful little ground cover. So um, more resources here for rain gardens is um, the, well, the, the storm quality design manual in uh, Sacramento is fantastic. They have a really, in Appendix J, they actually use the plant list from Alameda, which is probably the best plant for what we call green stormwater infrastructure. So if you're looking at vegetated swales or bioswales, uh, infiltration uh, ponds and, and areas, really nice uh, planting lists for there. Uh, Flows to Bay here from San Mateo is also a really good list. But a, a great one here is found at calflora.org, where you can go to the what grows here, and you can find your site um, on the map. And then what you do is you'd sort by riparian plant community. And that will tell you uh, in your area exactly which native plants normally would grow there in a riparian habitat. And it's a really good starting point. You can then cross-reference that list with perhaps an availability list from your local nursery and see you know, what, what plants are available and what would do well in your area. So here's some other ideas, right? Um, unfortunately, between our roof lines where we've got our big watershed, where we've got most of our water comes down, and then we've got our pathways going around our structures, we might consider doing what's called an overhead conveyance. So this can take the roof water, interrupt that downspout, take it over a pathway, and then drop it down into the garden. We also want to look at a, a runnel or a, a splash block, some kind of energy dissipator, where say you've got, if you've got a roof and a downspout, and then you want to remove the pipe that takes it to the street and instead open it up and let it flow through the landscape in some kind of dry stream bed and then have an overflow to go to the street. We want to make sure that when that where that concentrated flow opens up into the landscape, we've got some cobble there or some means of dissipating that energy so that we're not causing erosion. Now, when we get into these areas, you know, we don't want to just flow everything out into the street, but we want to allow things to build up and pond for a little bit. We just don't want to exceed 48 hours of ponding. So we want to make sure we've got that um, infiltration rate in our soils. So doing some kind of a catch basin with an atrium grate above grade, so you're allowing some ponding, but then the water would go in there and then get it out into the street. And the rule of thumb here for pipes is that you wanna make sure you've got 2% grade, which is about a quarter inch per foot, um, or about you know a couple feet in a in 100 feet. Ten, five to 10 minute warning. Okay, cool, thanks. We'll just jump ahead here. Um, so again, we're looking at the trees as interceptors of that rain, and then we're capturing the rain, and then we're flowing it out into our garden, into our rain gardens, right? Slow, spread, and sink. And so here's a, a nice little rain garden here. You can see those sedges. If you exceed a 5% grade along there, you might consider putting in these um, check dams here. Uh, that's a nice way to do that. The other thing to consider is this notion of hydraulic residence, which that would go with that phytoremediation, where it's got to be slow enough and stay in the system long enough such that we get um, the water actually filtered a little bit. 
this is cool. This is a backwater eddy. So this is a way to take some um, soil or water from the road and infiltrate it into the landscape, right? So again, we don't want to exceed that 5% here, uh, but we do want to do a soil mix with that compost component so that we can soak in that water. The other thing to look at is detaching not only our downspouts, but our hardscapes and using um, pervious paving. There's all kinds of pervious paving options available. The easiest one would be a permeable paver or maybe looking at a driveway and intercepting that driveway so that we can take the water that would normally flow into the gutter and instead maybe put in some kind of a strip drain and direct that into our rain gardens. So that's a, a really good way to take the, the rain that we've got from our watersheds, whether it's a patio or a roof or some kind of landscape area, get it into some kind of a dry creek bed, infiltrate it in there, make sure we've got the meandering, you planting it and using the gradation of rocks so that it looks more natural, uh, increasing the habitat value, and, and really just uh, accepting that we, we get a lot of water. There actually is quite a bit of abundance, but if we can plan for it and capture it in our landscapes, that's the best way to go. So here's a good quote. Don't pray for rain if you can't take care of what you get. And with that, um, I am going to stop my share and see if we have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Dave. That was super informative. Um, all right, everyone. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat now. Um, one question that we had before was if was if we would be sending out the replay. So we are recording this uh, workshop and we'll be sending it out um, to you all. Uh, someone said, thank you. This is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, wow, amazing. <laughs> I'm curious if anyone uh, has any rainwater capture or uh, if, you're, if you're contemplating putting in some kind of a, a dry creek bed or an infiltration rain garden. Awesome. Okay, we have two questions that came in. So one is, what about gray water going into these systems? Right. So gray water, right, by law, um, cannot be exposed. It has to be under two inches of either of some kind of mulch, whether it's an organic mulch or a gravel mulch. And you want to direct gray water into what, what we refer to as a mulch basin. So usually it's better to send your gray water to say some fruit trees or a planting area uh, rather than put it into here because this water really is, is it's going to get added to the rainwater and ideally there'd be an overflow. And so also legally you can't let gray water go off site. So the gray water really needs to go into mulch basins in the garden where it's going to soak in and you design that such that it it can't overflow whereas these rain gardens this is different this is we want it to flow flow in there much more water of the rain water and and then what doesn't soak in will go off site so you go on to keep those two separate um, okay. And then we have another question, but we also have another one on gray water. So I'm gonna ask that one first and then the other question. Um, so the other gray water question is, what regulations do we need for gray to install a gray water system? Yeah, so um, there's what's called laundry to landscape or L2L, and you can do that without a permit, right? Um, and then if you're going to do, um, what would we call a branched drain system, which would be to actually do a diverter in your house. Um, the rule of thumb there, at least what the code says, is, is it's 250 gallons per day. So if you're doing more than 250 gallons, then you need to have it engineered by, um, by someone who can stamp those plans for the permit. 
Um, the other thing to consider with that is that a kitchen sink is considered black water, right? Just like a toilet. So you're only allowed to take your showers and wash basins. So you really got to know what's going on with the plumbing before you take that on. The neat thing about the laundry to landscape is that your, your laundry washer already has a pump. And so that makes it really easy to pump the gray water out. So that, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb for the, the regulations. But again, it's got to be under mulch. It, it can't go uh, off site. Uh, and you're not allowed to store it for over 24 hours. So it's got to be used when it is um, when you when you get the gray water. Whereas a rainwater system, you can store rainwater, and then the overflow can go into your rain garden. So it it it's uh, it's a wonderful thing. It'd be great if everyone did both. Um, okay. And the next question is, how do you deal with expansive soil? So expansive soil is usually referred to with the clay component. If you have heavy clay soils, um, clay will expand and contract as it gets wet and it dries. And so, you know, changing your soil's uh, textural class is very expensive and, and usually doesn't work out that well. Uh, you know, you've got sand, silt, and clay. And really the easier thing to do there is adding the organic matter. So by integrating compost into the top six to eight inches of soil, you're then uh, taking those clay particles and aggregating them. And then that increases the soil pore space. If you can encourage natural soil microorganisms, like the little bacteria, they're sticky. And the fungal hyphae are like little ropes and strings. And so all these things, they, they help along with the, um, the fulvic and, and humic acids and the humus uh, to hold those clay particles together. And, and so that aggregation kind of uh, offsets that shrink swell and it allows you to have higher infiltration rates and a, a greater water holding capacity. Awesome. Um, okay, and then this question says, Oh, um, and someone's wondering about vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm wondering, so obviously with rainwater, yes, you can irrigate your veggies with rainwater. Uh, no problem there. If you're referring to gray water, not really. Uh, you, you're, first of all, you're not allowed to spray the, the water. So gray water is really best. You can have fruit trees, you can do berries, you can do things of that nature but the food crop cannot touch it, right? So for something like, like lettuce or spinach, that's really not a good idea. It should be for uh, fruits and, and berries if, if you're doing you know, gray water to a food forest kind of thing. Hopefully okay. that answers the question. Okay, um, we have someone. Okay, so somebody's former neighbor, um, used to promote this this kind of idea with her landscape designs company. Um, she drew <clears throat> this person's landscape plans for their front and backyard with the rainwater capture idea in mind, but uh, the landscape architect moved to Oregon, um, so they haven't been able to find anyone to help install um, their plan for an affordable price, and um, this person's wondering if you um, if you know anyone that can help them do this plan. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, well here, here's one, uh, one thought. There's two organizations um, that have a contractor search uh, capability. One is Rescape. So if you go to rescape.org, um, they're going to have a, um, a qualified landscaper list. And so you can look there and, and those people have been trained in um, rainwater harvesting and, and all of these things. So they'll know what's going on. They'll know how to do the sheet mulching and, and swap out the spray with drip, et cetera. The other thing to look at is clca.org. So that is the California Landscape Contractors Association. And they have a really nice contractor search 
uh, feature on their website where you can put in your zip code, whether it's residential or commercial, uh, what you want, do a search, and then you can get a list of contractors. You can look at their websites and, and see if their projects are in alignment with uh, what you're thinking. So I'd like to cross-reference the CLCA guys because they're all insured, they're all professionals. You know, you're gonna get a, a good dependable job with the Rescape list of people that are more ecologically aware um, and want to do the right thing for our, our habitat and, the, and the, the earth in general. So that's the best way, I think. Thank you, that was a great response. And I just typed that up in the chat. Um, and then the next question says, can you use asphalt roof water for veggies? Um, so you can, um, I know there are certain cities and municipalities have issues with uh, the asphalt roofs or usually what they're more concerned about is the older galvanized ones where there might be a lead issue but it, just a regular asphalt uh, shingled roof, it, I don't see any problem with that at whatsoever. Um, so, uh, but, but it's good also to make sure you get that first flush system. So the, when the rain first comes, right, a certain amount goes into the first flush system and, and gets out and that, so that cleans the system and gets the debris that's in the gutters out of there. And then you're just storing the good water um, and then from that, uh, anything else might settle out and you're taking it off the top, essentially. So, yeah, it, it should be fine. Great. All right, everyone. So we are ending the near of our, um, we're near the end of our program. There we go. Um, are there any final questions you all would like to share? Uh, I'll give you all a minute. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and share this. So, thank you so much for attending this program, um, Dave. I wish I had a garden so that I could put all these great plants in them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and. <laughs> if you want to continue to connect with Sustainable Contra Costa, um, you can visit our website, sustainablecoco.org. If you'd like to support our work, you can go to sustainablecoco.org slash support. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at info at sustainablecoco.org. And then uh, if you'd like to sign up for the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge, um, go ahead and go to cleanercontracosta.org. Um, uh, let's see. So if you have any further questions, um, Dave, do you want to put your email in the chat if anyone wants to uh, contact you directly? Yeah, sure. Um, and be sure to go to my website at gardenenlightenment.com and you can take the free uh, sheet mulching class. Awesome. So let me garden enlightenment. And, uh, and I'm at, at Dave at gardenenlightenment.com. That's okay. not too hard to, uh, to forget there. Awesome. All right, everyone. Um, gardenenlightenment.com. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Dave, and to our co-sponsor for the event, uh, Contra Costa Water District. Um, I've written down some of the awesome resources that you've shared, so I think I think those will be useful as well. Um, and if there are any final questions um, for Dave, you can stay on, but also just make sure to uh, contact him if you have any specific questions that you'd like to talk to him about.